tonight we're talking about ethics, and I begin with a narrative that helps focus the issue. Imagine you are a physician who have for some time been in practice beyond internship. Uh, on your ward in a hospital is a man whose stroke and then decline in all the vital signs has left him comatose for more than a year. You see his faithful and dutiful wife come in each day and sit by his side and try to relate to him, but uh, there is not even a flicker of an eyebrow to give her a sense that he is aware of her presence. One day, routinely, as you put your stethoscope on his chest, you discover a slight trace of pneumonia. Now, the dilemma. You know as a physician that if you postpone reporting this condition, that in three to four days he will likely be gone. And you say to yourself, perhaps that is the wisest and best thing to do for the sake of his family and many other considerations. On the other hand, you have taken as a physician the Hippocratic Oath. One of the undergirding motives of that oath is the promise that you will do all within your power to perpetuate life. So you have an obligation, having given your word, to prolong the life such as it is of this patient. On the other hand, as you think about the consequences, you wonder if you should postpone. Question, what should you do ethically? I didn't make the story up. I know the doctor involved. I will tell you that he deliberately did postpone, and the patient did die of pneumonia. And his conscience bothered him, and some time later he spoke of this to his superior and was told that if he ever again bent the rule in that manner, he would be broken as a physician and never practice again in the continental United States. We'll notice that that incident does bring a clash between what philosophers have called the teleological approach to ethics, where you ask yourself in assessing any ethical dilemma, what will be the consequences of my action? But there is also another category, the formalist approach to ethics, which holds that there are rules or laws of conduct, and you are not supposed to calculate consequences. The only question is, as our hymn has it, do what is right let the consequence follow. And in this case, my friend, let the question of the utilitarian effects dominate over the question of rules. Well, we live in a time when both science and philosophy have moved away from consideration of values. We want to talk facts. And it is often said in our generation that there is no way you can relate these two issues. Factual discovery versus value judgments. The most extreme form of distinguishing the two is to maintain that ethical judgments, so-called, judgments of what is right, wrong, good, bad, obligatory or not, are simply the emotional expression of personal preference and therefore utterly subjective. And in one extreme form of this view, the argument is that you don't even state a proposition when you say this is good. You simply say hurrah for this. A famous gestalt psychologist whose name is Wolfgang Kurler, K-O-H-L-E-R, argued in a classic book called The Place of Value in a World of Facts that there is a sense in which even values are objective. Beyond that, aesthetic values are objective. Questions of beauty 
as also questions of good, are ultimately in the same genre as questions of belief or fact. A professor at Harvard University some years ago responded to this sort of analysis by arguing that his name was C.L. Stevenson, that we have an emotive theory of ethics which in effect boils down every expression of commendation to I approve of X, do so likewise. Those are the two sentences he thinks are the meaningful translation of every expression of value. But he argued that disagreement about facts can never resolve such disputes. Another major writer, his name was Dunker, wrote on the what he called pattern of situational meanings. And I will give you a classic example. We're still in the midst of much controversy over the question of abortion. When you hear a person who argues for the right to life on behalf of the child, he is countered that a woman has a right over her own body and she has a right to decide whether she does or does not deliver a child. Dunker's point is that if you analyze what is in the background, factually, in the minds of these two opponents. It's not just a disagreement of attitude. It's a disagreement of fact. A Roman Catholic, for example, who opposes abortion, believes theologically that the instant of conception is the moment of the creation of a soul. So any discussion of whether there is a living person inside the mother from that moment is for him moot. The answer is yes, this is a soul, and if you abort, then there is a separation of soul from body, and that's murder. But there are many others who take the view that you do not have a living person until the person is delivered and then takes the first breath in which case an abortion is the removal of the streetcar that the person could have ridden into this life, but not the destruction of a soul. If, Dunker argues, you could get the two people to agree on the facts, they would likely come to the same conclusion ethically. In passing, I should observe that we have three different views in our own midst on the question of when the spirit associates itself permanently with the body prepared in the mother. Some believe at the very instant or shortly after conception. Some believe during the time of quickening, which isn't always the same. And finally, some believe only in the moment when <gasps> there is a breath and a cry and the child is in the world and alive. Another example of an attempt to save a factual understanding of moral judgment was the ideal spectator theory. When you say this is good or this is bad or this is right or this is wrong, the ultimate translation is, if we could bring into the situation an ideal spectator, the ideal spectator is God, a person who has all of the facts who is balanced in judgment, who is capable of anticipating consequences, such a person would say, when you say this is good, it is good, and that's factual, rather than merely an expression of personal preference or taste. Well, in classical Western thought, beginning with Aristotle and coming down to our time, there is a dominant theory which is even presently ensconced, at least in a partial manner, in the United Nations Bill of Rights. I'm referring here to the notion of natural law. It's referring to a law of human nature. It goes back to the idea in Aristotle that every person has within him an essence, and the essence can be fulfilled by achieving certain virtues, so godliness in the theological way of speaking unfolds one's essence to its full potential, kind of self-realization. Badness retards that essence. We all have the same basic essence. We are rational animals, all of us. 
it extends to the question of how you know what you ought to do. Because in the Nicomachean Ethics, one of Aristotle's major works, the proposal is made that this essence is so clear that you know when you are both advancing or retarding. An entire school of British philosophers known as the British Intuitionists have maintained that the way we all know what we ought to do and what is good is a matter of intuition. We don't know it by sense experience per se, and we don't know it by some sort of set of rules taught in our childhood. We know by intuition. There are three major views. They differ on the question of what it is intuition gives us. Some hold that you know by intuition that you ought to follow certain rules. You ought, for example, to keep your promises. You ought to maximize the good. You ought to apply the principle of least suffering to others around you, including animals. And they argue that's known by intuition, not any other way. Others maintain that what you know by intuition is some sort of non-observable quality called goodness. G.E. Moore, for one, argued that this is what he called a simple, non-natural characteristic, like yellow. All forms of the use of the word good, a good woman, a good shoe, a good automobile, a good meal, they all have in common this quality, which is not observable, as yellow is, by the eyes, but observable through intuition. And there's a third position that maintains that it is intuition that enables you in a given situation, only when you are in a situation of choice, to know what is the right thing to do. Well, to come back to the United Nations, let me dramatize. Some of you have seen the film called Judgment at Nuremberg, and it is the dramatization of the actual trial that took place after the Second World War when Nazi war criminals, so-called, were put on trial, not on the ground that they had been to their country loyal and to the Nazi unfolding Wehrmacht, the power machine, and that they had been good soldiers. The argument used in the court was they had committed crimes against humanity. The Holocaust, for example, the victimization of the Jewish people as a side part of the war effort, had no justification by any rules of war, and it was a violation of human rights, ultimate human rights. Now, all through the film, there is a man who was a physician who over and over says, I was never one of them. I was a German. I was not a Nazi. I didn't sympathize with the war. I did not participate in it. I am not one of them. But he is eventually convicted. When he signed a certificate as a doctor that permitted a certain man to be killed because he was a Jew, that was a crime against humanity. And in the last scene, when the court rules, and these men are condemned to various sentences in prison, this same man says to the judge, but you know, even though you've condemned me, you know I was never one of them. And he replies, on the day you signed that certificate, you became one of them. Well, the UN Declaration of Rights is an expansion of the same kinds of declaration we have in our Constitution and in its amendments. And the attitude of this country to the violation of such rights, as have recently occurred in what was Yugoslavia and what is still China, the condemnation of those is not, we are coming as an outside body with a different set of premises in our culture, and we're condemning yours, to which they could reply, well, ours is different, so what? The argument is that they are violating ultimate human rights regardless of their political stance or their present situation in the world. Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic interpreter, maintained that there are two kinds of absolute in the realm of ethics. There are moral virtues, 
moral virtues which are the expression of the tendency to fulfill your essence. And then there are intellectual virtues. And it is right and appropriate and good for you to develop intellectual virtues. And they are the same in all good men and women. You've heard the famous Carl G. Mazur definition of integrity. Put me in prison, no matter how deep you put me in a cell, no matter how many locks you put on the door, I can still get out. But draw a five-foot circle or so with chalk and put me inside of it and then get me to promise that I will not step outside of that circle. Will I? No. I would die first. But what if, after giving that word, I will keep my promise, he learns that in the next room, if he does not leave the circle, his wife will be attacked and raped and or killed. Does he have an obligation to stay within the chalk circle because he gave his promise? Is that an absolute? Or does he have an obligation not only to step outside of the circle and break the promise, but to prevent that act. If you promise a person that he can come by on the following Saturday and borrow your gun, and you say, fine, I'll, I'll have it here and it'll be loaded, and then you learn in the meantime that he intends to commit suicide, what are you going to do with your promise? Point, those are not absolutes. We are sometimes accused in our tradition of being absolutists in matters of ethics and morals. But not everything that we affirm is an absolute. Some are rules of policy, some are rules of wisdom, and some have to be modified and adapted to the circumstances. We give that much to what is called in our time situational ethics. But let me now give you what I believe to be an absolute, and it ties into a question that philosophers have argued for 2,000 years. It's the egoism versus altruism dispute. A philosophical egoist, this is different than a psychological egoist, maintains that everyone acts for his own pleasure or for his own desires. In other words, everyone is ultimately selfish. Whatever he does, even things that look like or appear to be efforts to assist others, he does for one reason only, namely his own satisfaction. So he is an egoist. Altruism is the term used in juxtaposition, which maintains that some at least of human acts result not from a desire to satisfy the self, but a desire to satisfy or help someone else. A mother who throws herself in front of an automobile to save the life of her child is considered an altruist. A person who does a good turn daily in order to get a merit badge in a court of honor may not be acting altruistically, but only buying publicity by his effort. When you see a lady coming out of a swinging door with packages too many to carry and you offer to assist her, an egoist would insist that when you're all through, you pat yourself on the back and say, what a good boy am I, I helped that little old lady. That was actually a selfish act which you did to satisfy yourself. Now, the ultimate question involved in this sort of analysis is the question of whether people do in fact act out of self-interest, and Joseph Smith was asked that question specifically. I'm going to read you what I consider to be a very profound reply. He says, in this world, Mankind are naturally selfish, ambitious, and striving to excel one above another. Yet, some are willing to build up others as well as themselves. Some people entirely denounce the principle of self-aggrandizement as wrong but it is a correct principle and may be indulged upon only one rule or plan, and that is to elevate, benefit, and bless others first 
Another version of this quotation is even stronger. It says, bless others also. If you will elevate others, the very work itself will exalt you. Upon no other plan or principle can a man justly and permanently aggrandize himself. Elsewhere he says, self-aggrandizement is a false principle if it means a man benefits himself at the expense of another. But everything that God does is to aggrandize his kingdom. Now, imagine the following scenario. Here is a person who says, I am so determined to achieve my own satisfaction and to avoid any pain in the process that rather than have you take a pin and hit my little finger for a drop of blood, rather than suffer that much pain, I am willing, indeed happy, to have the whole human race suffer forever. Would that be selfish? William James once said, this universe will never be all good until even the last cockroach that suffers the pains of unrequited love finds happiness. <laughs> to avoid one pinprick, this person is so selfish and self-regarding, he is willing that the rest of you, all sentient creatures, suffer forever. I call that selfish with a capital S. But what would you say about a person who is so concerned about others, indeed, all others, that rather than have them suffer, he is willing to suffer. Now, on the old philosophical side that people seek their own satisfaction, which is just a tautology, it means you do what you want to do. But on that typical analysis, the second person is just as selfish as the first. He's doing what he wants to do. He's willing to suffer for others. We have names in psychology for people who take joy in others' pain, sadists. We have people who literally punish themselves beyond all reason, and they are called masochists. My suggestion to you is that the two people I've been talking about here have names in Holy Scripture. The first is a fellow named Satan, and the other is named Christ. To say that they are equally selfish is nonsense. One is the saddest of saddists in the universe. The other, Jesus Christ, has sought the glory of his own Father and the glory of the whole human race, even though it cost an infinite price in his own suffering. Yes, they both are doing what they want to do, but between them is all the difference in the world. I submit to you that statement that the prophet makes is an absolute. You cannot not just will not, you cannot, because of the nature of the universe and the nature of your selfhood, achieve happiness by ignoring or neglecting or abusing others. You may try, and the world is going on with the trial, but you will fail, and that is a constant, as certain as that the sun will rise. That, I submit to you, is an absolute. There are others. But let's move to the next main question. I've been talking about right and commandment and duty and obligation as one set of ethical standards, and then on the other hand about self-realization, fulfillment, happiness, pleasure, pain. I believe that these are interrelated, and the Prophet Joseph Smith so teaches. Happiness, he said, is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And then he talks about the virtues and he talks about commandments. President Hinckley has said, as far as he can tell, the Ten Commandments was not a list of ten suggestions. It was a list of ten commandments. But they are obligatory not because a spoil sport decided to intrude them upon mankind. They are obligatory because followed they lead to fulfillment and happiness. 
John Stuart Mill and Utilitarianism, he writes at length, after Jeremy Bentham, about what does happiness mean. Bentham was called a quantitative hedonist. That is, he took the position that pleasure is the only ultimate good, and to maximize your pleasure is your duty. And he held the more the better, of course. Mill's point was that pleasures differ, and on the scale of pleasure vis-a-vis happiness, vis-a-vis joy, and I suppose the most inclusive word in our English vocabulary would be ecstasy, Uh, he held that these were qualitatively different, and therefore you couldn't just settle the question of what pleasure to seek on the ground of its quantity, but rather the quality. C.S. Lewis, in describing what he thought to be the beatific vision to come, talked of the little boy whose sister comes home after a date and reports that she's had the sweet experience that night of being kissed goodnight by her boyfriend. The little five-year-old is puzzled. What is so good about kissing? His main access to pleasure is chocolates. So the little boy says to his sister, well, it was really wonderful? Yes. Then he says, well, what did you do? Eat chocolates together? Well, no. The point is that there are higher pleasures and that Mill's point that qualitative differences ensue is sound. Well, so how do we relate obligation to goodness? We hold ultimately that the obligations arise from laws and that laws have consequences and that they do not tell you what you have to do. They tell you, as I keep repeating, the inevitable consequences of what you do do. A related issue. Which is more important, performance or motivation in the performance? Do you have to do things for the right reasons in order to obtain the fulfillment or the consequences? I had a professor who was taking on the relativistic analyses of motivation and pointing out that we have not yet come to any sort of agreement after a hundred plus years of efforts in psychology as to what is the dominant motive or a hierarchy of motives in mankind. What is it we all ultimately want? So in order to make his point, he said, let me uh, introduce a new theory. Instead of the Freudian theory or the Jungian theory or the whoever, I will call this the soporific theory of motivation. I maintain that what truly drives all of us day and night is the desire for sleep. All of us are living our lives for one compelling motive. We want to sleep. Now let me give you the evidence. People go on hikes. They claim they want to see the beauties of nature. No, no, that's all sublimation. They want to get tired in order to go to bed. You people think that people who love each other kiss and hug, and you suppose that the desire is for closeness and love. Nonsense. They want to get worn out and tired in order to sleep. We could go on with this, but you've already caught on. How does one refute such a theory? He always can cite instances, and you say, well, they say they're climbing up the mountain to see the view. I know that's what they say, but the hidden motivation is for sleep. Well, who knows our motives? I submit to you that observers from the outside may not ever really be very sure. This can save you a lot of arguments. Do not ascribe motives to others. Look inside and introspect, and you can probably find out some of your own. You don't know what is pushing, motivating others. Make shrewd guesses, but you don't know. So don't argue. Take them at their word. Ask. The ultimate person who knows our thoughts and motives, of course, in our understanding, is no one in this world. It's God. There is none else, says a revelation to Oliver Cowdery, 
that knows thy thoughts and the intents of thy heart, except God, none else. He looks upon the heart, and motives do matter. The entire Sermon on the Mount could be read, at least has been by some ethicists, as an attempt to take the ancient commandments and relate it to the question of why are you doing this? And what is inside of you when you are doing it? So, for example, if you pray to be seen of men, according to Jesus, you have your reward. Your intention was to get the attention of others so they'd say, my, my, what a reverent man. Well, that's what you wanted. That's what you received. But that isn't prayer. If you give generously as a philanthropist and give so that a golden plaque is put on the building, you have invested effort and the hard-earned cash of your career in a beneficent project. But you may have been motivated simply by a desire for publicity. I'm told of a conversation that once went on between Reinhold Niebuhr, the professor, the sort of neo-Orthodox Protestant theologian who taught at Union Theological in New York, which is adjacent to Rockefeller Center. And someone said to him, Rockefeller didn't care about education when he built Columbia University or when he built Union Theological Seminary. He just had a guilty conscience. And Niebuhr replied, what's wrong with a guilty conscience? making the point that from his point of view, if Rockefeller finally did come around to care about doing something with his wealth, which could have been ill-gotten, then good for Rockefeller. Shouldn't have put his name on it, but otherwise it was all right. It's taught in our tradition that anonymity, that giving without others knowing you are giving, is the highest form of giving. Motives do matter. And he who means well, even if he does not perform well, is farther along. But he will soon learn that he must also perform well. Both performance and motives matter. Let me move next to some discussion about the motivation of love. Classical treatment of love is in it. Swedish theologian Anders Nygren expanded by C.S. Lewis in his famous essay called The Four Loves. Eros, philia, agape, sorge. The definition of sorge is the love of things. I suppose uh, Cadillacs and motorcycles. The other three relate to other persons. Eros, of course, erotic love, which culminates in marriage, in the deep affection of mothers and fathers for themselves and for children. Agape is the Greek word for the love of God, which is supposedly disinterested and total. And the other term, philia, means brotherly love. I suggest to you that in Christian ethics, Love is central and prominent and even dominant. Some have summarized Greek ethical thinking around four main virtues, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. If those are the four Greek virtues, then the three Christian virtues are faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is, yes, charity. And we have in our own sacred texts an expansion of the meaning of the term the pure love of Christ, which I take to be double-edged. I believe it refers to his pure love for us, but also our pure love for him. And our scriptures make it clear that this is so powerful, a force, a radiation, that it can fill a person. And we're told to pray for that, that we may be filled with this love. And if we are possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with us. All other ethical questions have to be related, as I understand it, to that central issue. Are my actions, my thoughts, and my motives motivated ultimately 
by love. I turn next to a related question, namely to an orchid's example that will get us into a question of how we know. Is it by conscience? Is it by cumulative wisdom from the past? Is it by anticipation of consequences? Is it by the spirit? This is the artificial example, but it could happen. You and your friend are shipwrecked, and as you find yourselves on a small island, you're able to live because there are fruits that fall almost uh, at will from trees into your hands, but the only other advantage of the island is that it it has a profusion of orchids, and your friend was born an orchid lover, and so he sets about the daily activity of raising, cultivating, and enjoying orchids. One day he exacts a promise from you, namely, if I should be fatally beamed by a coconut and you are left alone on this island, I want a promise from you that you will take care of my present crop of orchids until they bloom and are beautiful. Promise me, as a friend, that you will do this. You promise. I will. Well, shortly the inevitable happens. You bury him in the sand, and the next day a ship arrives, the first and perhaps the last, which will take you back to civilization. Question, do you stay, keep your promise, and take care of the orchids, or do you get on board the ship? The great majority would get on the boat and leave. Now, why? Well, all sorts of plausible reasons which were not part of the story originally. Well, I had earlier made a promise to my wife that I would get home as soon as possible, and <laughs> that takes precedence over my promise to my friend. Or, I didn't tell my friend when I made the promise that orchids affect my asthma, and uh, if he had been alive, he wouldn't have asked me to make the promise when I finally got down to keeping it. All this sort of thing. To avoid the ultimate issue, does you or does you not keep your promise? I suggest to you that in the real dilemmas of real life, neither the he had been alive, he wouldn't have asked me to make the promise when I finally got down to keeping it. All this sort of thing. To avoid the ultimate issue, does you or does you not keep your promise? I suggest to you that in the real dilemmas of real life, neither the anticipation of consequences nor the application of rules is fully satisfactory. Another factor must be involved. I'm going to be, for a moment, autobiographical. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, but a dilemma arose when I was at your age and stage. I was proposing seriously to get married, but I had no visible means of support. I was in the least practical field in the universe, namely philosophy. You've never seen a want ad in the paper for a philosopher. I wanted to get married. I did not have a visible means of support. I agonized over the when, not the whether, but the when, and kept postponing. And finally, when we were at loggerheads, the lady to be the bride and I, over the question of when, and I had kept her waiting a long time, we decided to go for counsel. I had a piece of paper, and on it, uh, column A and column B. In column A, I had at least ten reasons why not yet, and only one uh, for why now. And the one on why now was because I'd love to. Uh, he didn't listen to more than two of my why nots and then said, get married. And after my chin dropped on my chest, he added, soon, like tomorrow. <laughs> what rules apply here? <laughs> and uh, what consequences was he calculating? Was he a utilitarian? And how dare he preempt my choice? Well, we did it. And uh, it wasn't until four and a half years later, when my wife had reached the ripe old age of 28, that we learned from the Rock Clinic in Boston that she could have no more children.
my wife could not have children, it slowly began to dawn on me that if I had ignored the counsel I was given and postponed marriage for a year, we would not have a little girl named Mindy. If I had waited more than that, two to three years, we would not have Barney. Maybe any. All through our lives, we have uh, encountered, sometimes a little behind our backs, the comment, well, the Madsons only have three children. I wonder why they don't have more. But we wonder, too. Conclusion. Not the application of a rule in Kantian formal terms and not the calculation of consequences helped us much. In that situation, we followed the counsel of a wise and we now believe inspired man. I went back years later and thanked him in tears. We need to know in a way beyond the best efforts we can make by our own analysis and reasoning. That's why we do not have in the Mormon Church a manual of discipline that has all the rules for all conceivable choices in action. We have scriptures, many of which say, call upon me, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find. Do not trust fully in the arm of flesh, but seek my spirit and I will guide you. If you want to know the rules that apply, and if you want to know a little at least about the consequences, or at least if you want to receive a divine nudge not knowing either, then you are to keep reaching for divine guidance which we love to call revelation and inspiration. Can you therefore trust your conscience in ethics? This is a very basic question. And my answer is no, not fully. Conscience itself can be warped, or as Paul put it, seared with a hot iron. Conscience is in fact conditioned by environment and teaching to some degree. And the clearest and most sensitive conscience again is only in the person who has responded to the inspiration and power of the living God. We had a visitor here, famous theologian, who was terribly troubled over the dilemma of whether God is everywhere and yet at the same time wanted to believe the biblical tradition about personal presence. Even the idea that God is somehow more present in his sanctuary, namely the temple, than in any other place, posed for him a terrible dilemma, since on the first view God is everywhere. I said to him, have you never thought of the alternative, that God as a person is both some place and some time, therefore not everywhere at once, but that his emanating spirit the radiant power of life and light extends throughout the very extent of space. And he struck his two temples with his hands and said, I never thought of it. But that's the most elementary insight in the restoration understanding of God. God by his spirit is everywhere, but not in the same degree. God is only present where he and his spirit are permitted to be. And he will be inquired of by his children. The ultimate answer, therefore, to what is good, and how do we know, is God is good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.